Watching the world burn, watching the world burn, September 26th, 2024, let's get into it. All right, so I, I got a comment talking about the lighting, uh, how bad my lighting is. <laughs> and you're absolutely 100% correct. I have looked on uh, YouTube at various lighting options and they got all these big lights and stuff that I could buy, and uh, I don't know, man. I mean, if you have a suggestion, leave it below. Uh, I mean, if, you, if you've got a lighting solution, because, I, you know, I did notice that that's why the shade is down this time, is that the, the light was reflecting off of the window. Uh, so, trust me, I do the best I can with these videos, and I don't make no damn money. I just do these because I want to save the world. All right, so the first uh, story I wanted to get into, and this is uh, posted on X. And uh, if you're not on X, it's that cyber sec guy, that cyber SEC guy on X. And, uh, and I posted this video, it was from um, uh, Muckraker, and uh, it was all about child and human trafficking. You know, the Democrats are the child and human trafficking party. Uh, they get a lot of money from child and human trafficking, and they get a lot of uh, money from women being raped in brothels all across the United States. Uh, but, I mean, it's a it's a 20-minute video, so obviously I couldn't show you the whole video. I mean, <laughs> that would be my whole video, right? So let's just watch the beginning of that right now. They have all of the kids wearing masks, and they have them keeping their head down. They're telling them to hide their face. Many of these kids go missing. I've even had a little friend. I can't remember her name, but she said she didn't know where she would go. And MVM is an organization that has moved thousands. I do not work for you. You do not work for MVM? I'm on vacation. You said, you said that you were on vacation and now you're moving this small child to the airport. I thought you were on vacation. Do you have any comment about the children that have gone missing that you've helped to escort across the country? Two children were delivered to a sponsor that lives at this address, but as you can see, Nobody lives here, and honestly, it doesn't look like anybody's lived here in quite a long time. There's kids in the car here. They're moving these kids. They just turn the lights off. We owe a debt of 10000 for me, and another 10000 for my brother. That van that we just confronted, they are now taking off. We are following them. This van is now trying to lose us. They're driving through this neighborhood that's headed absolutely nowhere. Are a lot of the, the kids coming over here, are they, are they trafficked or like, what's the... Some are. I'm not going to lie. Some are. She cried because she didn't know what they would do with her. We went to sleep, and in the morning, when I got up, she was gone. Since 2021, an average of 400 unaccompanied children are smuggled into the United States every day. These children, who cross into the United States without parents, are subsequently detained, processed by the federal government's unaccompanied children program, and eventually released into the country. On August 19th, 2024, the Department of Homeland Security announced that they had lost track of over 300,000 of these children. In June of 2024, a government insider from the Department of Health and Human Services provided Muckraker with a list detailing the names of over 8,000 alien children, along with their last known addresses. So, we began an operation to find the missing children ourselves. Over the course of our investigation, we discovered the dangerous places where children had been delivered, confronted a CIA contractor who moves these children, heard shocking stories from children who the federal government has lost track of, and exposed a child trafficking network in Florida. This report brings to light the fate of the forgotten children who have fallen victim to the criminal negligence of the United States federal government. All right, so that was just kind of an introduction to, to, the, to the video. Like I said, it's on X. You can go there and watch it. I'm not going to post it any other place. Uh, I, the, the next thing that I wanted to get into, because this kind of adds into my, uh, my the four horsemen of the apocalypse are running amongst us. And, uh, and so Russia, they just updated their nuclear doctrine. And, you know, it's funny. This is why I was telling you that the banning of RT from from uh, American television uh, is a bad thing. And so I, luckily I'm still able to get onto 
uh, RT and I get onto Al Jazeera and I, I watch a lot of alternate channels. Uh, as you saw, I did Sky News yesterday, right? Everybody says, oh, you just watch all that right-wing propaganda. You watch all that right-wing stuff. No, I watch, I, I try to watch everything, man. I'm only one dude. I only got so much damn time, man. And the only reason I do it is because, like, today, I, of course, the hurricane is coming. Hey, quick hurricane story for you before we get into the next uh, video. I, so I, I broke the lid on my uh, washing machine. And I called up Maytag, and I said, how much would a new lid cost me? Uh, $300. $300 for a freaking lid for a washing machine. I mean, when you think about it, you know, you got the motor, you got the drum, you got, you know, all that metal and everything. You got the, the, the digital panel and everything. But they wanted $300 for a lid. I said, well, hell, man, I might as well get a new damn washing machine. Because it is seven years old, but, I mean, it still works great. All I got to do is put some bricks on top of the lid and hold it down and I can still wash clothes. But I mean, who wants to do that? So I, I called up Home Depot and there was a beautiful young woman, uh, Amber, and uh, we talked about washing machines. Uh, oh my gosh, I guess she talked for me for a half an hour. I ended up settling on a GE front loader uh, and I got the 5.3, which is the premium model. Uh, 5.3 cubic, uh, I don't know, because I want to be able to wash my comforters and everything. And, uh, and okay, all said and done with taxes and a, a three-year protection plan, I'm out $1,200. So the moral of the story is, is that sometimes you have to throw uh, bad money after good. All right. I could have bought that $300 lid, maybe gotten it on the, on the washing machine and used it for another three or four years okay because uh, it like i said it was seven years old or or take that three hundred dollars and put it towards a new washing machine now is my budget wrecked for this month yeah i'm absolutely wrecked i got i mean i i got nothing i i can't even buy groceries i'm going to be probably using my mres <laughs> to eat for the next month but you know it's the nature of the beast now the, the why i wanted to tell you this story is so i contacted home depot and I said, look, man, I mean, you know, are you guys really going to deliver the washing machine uh, on the 26th? Because we've got a tropical storm coming through here in Florida. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to deliver it. I said, I said, don't you think you're putting your crew at risk in some fashion? I mean, you know, do they really want to be out in a tropical storm delivering a washing machine? Oh, we don't care about them. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to deliver regardless. That's what we pay them for. So these guys are going to be out. I've already looked at the weather forecast. We're going to have 60 mile an hour winds and rain coming down in, in, in huge amounts. And these guys are going to be here at 7 o'clock in the morning delivering a washing machine because Home Depot tells them they got to do it. This is, this is your corporate world in the United States. I... It, does it blow your mind? Because it blows mine. I gave them two chances. I actually made two phone calls. And I was like, because I wasn't going to cancel it. I mean, I'm like, you know, you, you guys do what you want. You know, I mean, but if you're really going to deliver a washing machine in the middle of a tropical storm in 60 mile an hour winds, okay, so be it. All right. So I guess we'll see what happens tomorrow. I'll, I'll make the next video to give you the, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Anyway, so this is Russia's updated nuclear doctrine. In the updated version of the document, aggression against Russia by any non-nuclear state, but with the support of a nuclear state, is proposed to be considered as their joint attack on Russia. Russia will also consider the possibility of using nuclear weapons when receiving reliable information about a massive launch of means of aerospace attack and their crossing of our state border. This includes strategic and tactical aircraft, as well as cruise missiles and drones, hypersonic and other delivery vehicles. Russia reserves the right to use nuclear weapons in case of aggression, including if the enemy, using conventional weapons, poses a critical threat. It is important to note at this point that these are at this time proposals, proposals to amend Russia's nuclear weapons use doctrine. We heard from Vladimir Putin multiple scenarios in which the rules and regulations governing how Russia can use its nuclear weapons will change. The first scenario is if a non-nuclear power attacks Russia with conventional arms but poses 
uh, a grave or, or critical threat to Russian sovereignty, uh, the Russian leadership will be able to use nuclear weapons to neutralize that threat. The second scenario and how things will change is if that non-nuclear power that is attacking Russia is aided, supplied, abetted by a nuclear power, then that nuclear power will be considered uh, a party to this conflict, so uh, a, a joint attack on Russia, which will mean Russia will be able to use nuclear weapons uh, both on the non-nuclear power and the nuclear power that it will consider attacking it. Also, uh, Russia will be able to use, preemptively perhaps use, uh, nuclear weapons if there is verified information, proof that there is an ongoing attack on Russia uh, using aerospace, uh, aerospace assets or, for example, a mass launch of drones. Again, I must mention that these are, at this time, are proposals on how Russia's uh, uh, first use of nuclear weapons, its nuclear doctrine, uh, will change. Nevertheless, this is a stark warning to the West that are the latest in a slew of such. Previously, Vladimir Putin had come out and said that if Western, advanced Western missiles with great ranges are supplied to Ukraine and used against Russia to, uh, for strikes deep into Russian territory, then those countries, the United States perhaps, or Great Britain or France, which supply Ukraine with, uh, with extended range missiles, that they will be complicit in an attack on Russia. Russia has brushed off their arguments that uh, they merely hand these weapons over. Russia says it has uh, evidence and there is no way that Ukraine can plan, launch and use these weapons without uh, Western, well, without, without NATO troops uh, being involved, without Na NATO technical staff being involved, without uh, NATO intelligence and NATO satellites being involved. But this comes at a dangerous time, at a time when many Western leaders are, are saying, ignore uh, Putin and Russia's warnings, supply Ukraine with these missiles, uh, and undoubtedly, even though they won't change anything, Undoubtedly, uh, Ukraine, they believe, will be able to uh, resist Russia further. An argument that both military experts and the Russian government uh, have said is in itself uh, senseless. All right, so that was Putin, and uh, he's given another uh, warning. Uh, we're just going to roll through the videos at this point. Uh, I did want to talk about logistics for just a minute. Uh, a lot of people don't understand. They think that... The tanks rolling in, or the guys uh, riding in on motorcycles, or the the, um, the the track vehicles dropping off the troops, uh, uh, the artillery fire, the missiles launching uh, with bombs going off, and the cluster bombs, all that. Yes, all that is, uh, the communications, all that's part of war. But you know what? The biggest element to war is it's logistics. And you know who the, the least paid people in the military are? <laughs> it's, it's the logistics. It's kind of like Motor T, right? The guys that transport everything. It, you, it, if you're a troop on the front line and you don't have food for about three days, you're not going to be very effective. If you can't get water to the troops, uh, especially, I mean, if they're in heavy combat, I mean, you need a shitload of water, man. If you don't have water, if you don't have ammunition, if you don't have everything, logistics, 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 logistics is the key to combat. And these are the people behind the scenes that get the least amount of credit. And they are the most essential to any war on the planet. Well, guess what? Ugladar is about to fall in the Donbass. The fortress is taken. It is over. You said this fortress would never fall while your men defend it. They still defend it. They have died defending it. In fact, the Russians are in the city right now. Now, this is a major, major logistics hub for Ukraine. And uh, when this falls, uh, I dare say, I mean, we're, we're seeing the rapid... Uh, 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 I, this is just like... In World War II, during 1945, when when Russia, I mean, or uh, Nazi Germany, was just getting slaughtered, and this is what's happening. And so, once this logistics hub falls, 
Uh, it's nothing but flat territory for the Russians to just roll over. You're, I dare say, I, I'm predicting that this war is going to be over by the election. And then what's the West going to do? Are we going to drop tactical nuclear weapons? All right, so let's just watch that video right now. Ukrainian defenses in the Donbass continue to crumble. The Russian Ministry of Defense has announced the capture of two further settlements, Grigorovka and Austria, both uh, situated just to the west of Donetsk city. But this is all against the backdrop of much worse news for Kiev, and that is the situation in Ugliadar, a much bigger city, a city that has been dubbed a fortress due to its position on the heights uh, surrounding lower land made up uh, of high-rise apartment buildings, a city that was made for defense and which Russian forces have entered for the first time uh, in more than two years since the start of this uh, special military operation. After seizing uh, land adjacent to it to the east and to the west, Russian troopers are now fighting for the high-rise buildings inside that this is a nightmare scenario for Ukraine, which has come to see uh, Ugliadar as something of a symbol, a resistance symbol, uh, and for the situation to deterior deteriorate so rapidly uh, is indeed for Ukraine very bad news, especially given how important the city is as a logistics uh, hub for Ukraine, but also for Russia, because it'll allow Russia, which has uh, forged a land route, a train route uh, from the Russian mainland to Crimea, to also link southern Dom Donbass with northern Donbass by rail, which will uh, ease uh, military operations, which will ease supply lines uh, and allow Russia to advance uh, much more rapidly and with much greater efficiency than it has before. The Ukrainian establishment, as well as the Ukrainian Institute of War, are already preparing the Ukrainian public for the fall of the city, uh, now saying that, you know, it has lost its importance as a logistics hub due to the fact that many of the uh, outlying roads and routes are already controlled by Russia. Uh, indeed, on Ukrainian television, they're now saying that after all this time, soldiers' lives have become more important than Ugledar. In order to save people, it will be necessary to withdraw. No matter how difficult it is to state this today, this temporary loss of territory does not compensate if we hold on to the last fighter, our guys, their children and health. Therefore, if such a decision is made, taking into account the situation, it really happens today that the enemy attacks Ugledar from at least three sides. Thank the 72nd Brigade of Cossacks for getting through the past two and a half years. According uh, to troops inside the city that we've spoken to, uh, there's no outright collapse of Ukrainian defenses there. Ukrainian uh, troops are indeed launching counterattacks. There is vicious fighting, vicious uh, battles that are, are happening, not only building by building, but floor by floor. Russian assault troops uh, seizing uh, new buildings, fighting to maintain control. Ukrainian troops counterattacking, trying to beat Russian troops back out of the city. Indeed, very fierce fighting. Uh, but... There is little doubt at this point that it is only a matter of time before uh, the Russian flag is hoisted over the city of Ugledar. All right, so that 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 was the Ugledar. I mean, I can't do it any better than RT. That's what they were describing. Ah, uh, you know, a lot of people don't understand what's taking place in Lebanon right now. You know me, I I consider Israel an evil uh, country. Uh, just because of their actions in the last year, uh, exterminating the Palestinians. I know that Sean Hannity and a lot of uh, right-wing hosts, uh, Mark Levin, uh, you name it, Todd Stearns, I mean, you name them, man. They, they, they're all for uh, two million dead Palestinians, women, children, everything. Just exterminate them, because I, I guess they're subhuman. Uh, but now, I guess Lebanon has become subhuman. Uh, I don't understand it. I don't understand how people in the United States... I, okay, so now, at first it was the Palestinians and they're just Arabs and they all need to be exterminated. But now, we're going to exterminate Lebanon. Let's watch that video. Israel has significantly escalated this conflict, unleashing one of its most intense and widespread air assaults on Lebanon in decades. The strikes came in waves. One 
after another across southern Lebanon, as well as the east. These are areas where Hezbollah has a presence. But the Israeli military strategy appears to include attempts to cause a bigger displacement crisis. Okay, there's a lot of panic. People are making their way out of this area. A few minutes ago, there's been another airstrike. You can see the smoke. These airstrikes have been happening since the early hours of the morning, in fact, in, in recent days, and we are very, very close to the southern city of Tyre. Fighter jets are also hitting what Israel says are Hezbollah positions on the highway leading to the capital, Beirut. The Israeli army says this is just the beginning. People are leaving, traffic almost at a standstill after Israel ordered them to leave areas where it says Hezbollah is storing weapons. Already, this nearly year-long conflict has displaced more than 100,000 people from Lebanese villages along the border. But the UN says another 150,000 live about 10 kilometers north. Like in Gaza, Israel seems to have decided once again to put civilians in harm's way. For over 20 years, Hezbollah has deployed its arms inside homes and militarized civilian infrastructure. As a result, the Hezbollah terrorist organization has turned southern Lebanon into a battlefield. Israel's stated war objective is to return residents to their homes in the north of the country, which Hezbollah has repeatedly targeted in support of Palestinians in Gaza. We are not able to reach the site of the strike. Uh, there's a lot of chaos here. They are worried that there's going to be another strike. Lebanese citizens are being killed. Hundreds injured, among them women, children, and paramedics. Hospitals have been told to postpone non-urgent surgeries and treat people injured in what officials call Israel's expanding aggression against Lebanon. Parents were asked to fetch their children from school after tens of thousands of people received calls from local numbers warning them to evacuate for their safety. Israel is accused of using psychological warfare to create chaos and spread fear among a population already on edge. We said from the start that we do not want war, and Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah said that we do not want to bomb civilians. We are bombing military positions. But they are treacherous criminals. They cross all the lines. The nearly relentless strikes haven't prevented Hezbollah from launching rockets across the border. It's already called this an open-ended battle of reckoning. Zana Khudr al-Jazeera, Tyre, southern Lebanon. All right, so that, that's, that's Lebanon. Uh, you know, and then, of course, uh, it looks like Trump is getting a bit better protection. And you know that I said he needs to get veterans uh, to take care of him because I don't trust the Secret Service. I, certainly the FBI is. <laughs> I Like I said, if they ever come to your door, you tell them I ain't saying a damn thing without a lawyer. Get the hell away from me. You know, if you want to lock me up, take me away. But I ain't say it. Don't say nothing to the FBI. Never, ever speak to the FBI. Uh, anyway, so that, that's just my advice. But this is Tulsi Gabbard on uh, uh, Bob, Bobby Kennedy and, and Trump being denied protection. Yeah, Sean, it is unfathomable, except this is the reality of the Joe Biden, Kamala Harris administration. This should be the fundamental core question is, why did they deny President Trump and Bobby Kennedy, for that matter, who also has had threats on his life, why did they deny them the security that they needed? President Trump's campaign had asked for additional security over and over again, and it was President Biden who denied that security. So yes, it, it is deeply disturbing to see that, you know, that Iran is supporting these assassination attempts, but they're not the only ones. We know that the drug cartels, that any of these entities that President Trump is a threat to their existence, uh, they, they are trying to take him out. And President Biden's unwillingness to ensure his security from the get-go is absolutely unconscionable. The other thing that, yeah, that is also way, of I've... great concern is a, a, a recent Rasmussen poll, Sean, real quick, that showed almost 30 percent of Democrats are quietly hoping that Donald Trump is assassinated. And this is a direct How consequence of the years-long effort to dehumanize President Trump so that people don't feel so bad about uh, uh, doing these kinds of, of, of incredulous actions and attempts on his life. And the president and his team have asked repeatedly and have been denied repeatedly more security. 
just for the record. You talk about Kamala Harris and President Trump's campaign, their challenges and their opportunities. What are they? Well, you know, President Trump has the opportunity here in these final five and a half weeks before Election Day to really do what he's been doing, continuing to speak the truth about Kamala Harris's disastrous record, uh, the harm and hardship she has caused for the American people, everything from the increased cost of living that's created such hardship for people who have to make difficult choices about basic necessities that they can afford, to the wide open borders that have caused tens of millions of illegal immigrants to cross our borders. You talked about the, the heart-wrenching consequences of the American people and young women and girls who've been raped and murdered by some of these Venezuelan gang members and others. And then we look at our foreign policy. We look at the fact that under Harris and Biden, we are now embroiled in multiple wars around the world. We are closer to the brink of World War III and nuclear war than, than we have been before. Uh, the truth is what the American people deserve. Kamala Harris is doing everything she possibly can to hide the truth from the American people and has created this lie uh, and, and a narrative that her pollsters yeah. have, have sold uh, as, as what needs to happen in order for her to win. All right, so, uh, and then, of course, I got to finish off with a, a, a couple of cute videos here. Uh, this was, I tell you, when I listened to Kamala, somebody asked me, man, they said, you know, what, what's it like when you, when you have to watch all these videos on Kamala Harris for, for, to make your, your videos? I said, it's like somebody raking their fingernails down a chalkboard, man. That's exactly what it's like. But anyway, so uh, we're going to finish off with uh, Kamala Harris. And then, uh, by the way, this is the cutest thing ever. It's only 20 seconds. It's an octopus punching some fish because the octopus was getting pissed off, man. <laughs> and, I, you know, and I just thought, I was watching the video and I thought, man, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. An octopus punching fish. Peace out. Stay free. We need to guard that spirit. We have to guard that spirit. Let it always inspire us. Let it always be the source of our optimism, which is that spirit that is so uniquely American. And let that then inspire us by helping us to be inspired to solve the problems that so many face, including our small business owners. Mm -hmm.